Michael Dees is one of the world's eminent trombonists, lending his versatile sound and signature improvisations to over 200 recordings and groups as diverse as Grammy-winning artists including David Sanborn, Christian McBride, Michelle Camilo, and Alicia Keys. Born in Augusta, Georgia, he played the saxophone and trumpet before choosing the trombone at age 17. In 2001, Dees moved to New York City to become part of the historic first class of jazz students at the Juilliard School earning both bachelor's and master's degrees and quickly establishing a reputation as a brilliant soloist, side person, and band leader. Nevermore Here, Positone 2019, Dee's new release is a reflection of the influence of Charlie Parker on his life and is much deeper than a collection of bird tunes. These songs depict Parker's influence and other creative directions, paths less traveled by protégés J.J. Johnson, Jackie McLean, Jimmy Heath, and John Lewis. Parker's influence sparkles in artist composers Eric Alexander and Eddie Daniels represented here. As a band leader, this is Dee's seventh album for Positone and 13th of his career, and features Rini Rosnes, Rufus Reed, Lewis Nash, and Steve Wilson to shine new light on these mostly rare songs. Dee's recently won the 64th annual Downbeat Magazine Critics Poll Award for Rising Star Jazz Trombonists, the 2017 Best Tr Jazz Trombonist from New York City's Hot House Magazine, and is a sought-after and three-time Grammy Award-winning lead, section, and bass trombonist with today's leading jazz orchestras. His experience include bands led by Christian McBride, Roy Hargrove, Nicholas Payton, Charles Tolliver, Rufus Reed, the WDR Big Band, the NDR Big Band, Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra, and the Dizzy Gillespie All-Star Big Band. However, it is on the front line of quintets and sextets led by master musicians like the Heath Brothers, Winard Harper, Rini Rosnes, Bill Charlap, Claudio Roditi, and Louis Nash where Dees has revitalized the trombone's image. Not content to simply improvise, Dees arranges and composes for many different bands and constantly adjusts his tone and timbre to add just the right flavor to the music. Dee's unique blend of curiosity, hard work, and optimism has helped him achieve worldwide recognition, including awards from ASCAP, the International Trombone Association, Yamaha, Eastern Trombone Workshop, New York Youth Symphony, among others. Dee's was recently profiled in Cicely Janice's book, The New Face of Jazz, an intimate look at today's living legends. His experience in the studio led him to produce several recording sessions for emerging artists, often composing and writing lighter notes for these releases. A recipient of the prestigious MSU Teacher Scholar Award in 2018 and the Michigan Distinguished Professor of the Year in 2019, Dee's singular talent has made him an effective teacher, resulting in invitations, master classes, and residencies at the University of North Texas, Temple University, New World School of the Arts, UNC Chapel Hill, and among many, many, many others. He currently teaches jazz trombone and improvisation at the Michigan State University College of Music and has also served as faculty at Queens College, CUNY, the New School and Northeastern University. Consistently in demand around the world as a summer workshop jazz educator, Michael Dees serves as director of the Jazz Institute at Brevard, part of the storied Brevard Music Center in North Carolina. Many of Deez's current and former students have earned international recognition and are enjoying successful careers in New York City and around the world. Considered an informed but forward-thinking musician, Deez learned the craft from trombone legends Wycliffe Gordon, Joseph Alessi, and master teacher Dr. John Drew. His associations have run the entire spectrum of musical experience. Alicia Keys, Kirk Franklin, Kanye West, Paul Simon, John Batiste, Aretha Franklin, John Mayer, The Temptations, Paul Schaefer and the CBS Orchestra, Elton John, Neil Diamond, Illinois Jacquette, Slide Hampton and the World of Trombones, Fred Wesley, Maceo Parker, the WDR Big Band, George Grunts, Billy Harper, and numerous others. 
Michael enjoys spending every possible minute with his extraordinary wife and professor of percussion at MSU, Gwendolyn Dees, and their daughters, Brooklyn and Charlie J. He is also an aspiring painter, sports car enthusiast, amateur coffee snob, Star Wars scholar, 80s horror movie aficionado, and bassist. Michael Dees is a Yamaha performing artist and proudly uses and endorses Yamaha brass and woodwinds, Van Doren reeds and mouthpieces, Best Brass Japan Mutes, Picket Brass Mouthpieces, and Ultrasone Headphones, Hercules Stands, and AMT Microphones. So how are you mm. doing, Prof? I'm good. I'm good. It's a, you know, it's a busy house. You know, the, the, the kids are two and four now. We're gearing up for the fall semester. Uh, the faculty are meeting every week and discussing, you know, the best protocol for safety and how to keep aerosol aerosolized droplets from brass instruments from traveling, you know, at a distance. Wow. So we're, we're hard at work trying to trying to figure out the best way to get back to work. Yeah. yeah. Well, at least yeah. you're staying busy with the kids. Yeah, this is, this is so much fun. It's like, uh, you know, I have I have never taken a break, actually, in my whole career, you know, from when I started music, I just I never had a time where I just you know, I, and I, I've, I haven't taken a complete break because I'm still, I had to write an, a, a chart for Lift Every Voice and Sing, and and um, uh, I had to play a track. I have to record a track next week, but but in between those things, like, I've had, I've gotten a second to just focus on family and mm. and kind of recharging. Yeah. That's killing. Wow. Well, what have you been doing to recharge during the quarantine? I've been reading a lot. Hey. I've been reading a lot of a lot of um a lot of things but you know democracy in black um, elaine jones's uh, autobiography that was just released not too long ago she was the uh timpanist and the, the first african-american timpanist to win a uh you know a major job like that ever and and her story is really powerful because uh you know she grew up in harlem and her parents are from uh, barbados and so she you know, grew up hard knocks in the neighborhood, uh, picked on, you know, uh, you know, feeling, you know, challenged by, by uh, segregation and everything. And, and she just determined and, and willfully forced her way to the top through hard work and perseverance. So that's, 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 a, that's a great book. Um, I just got a Walter F. White, who was the uh, secretary for the NAACP back in the day. And he was sent out by the organization to photograph lynchings and, wow. and almost do like reconnaissance of a type against, against uh, you know, the white power regimes of the day. But he, he was African-American man that looked like a white person. Mm -hmm. He had blonde hair, blue eyes, fair skin. I mean, he looked whiter than I look. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was really, uh, so yeah, I mean that's just three of the books. I mean I'm I have enough I have enough to read way too. I, you know, I hope I catch up on it one day. Mm -hmm. Same. How about you guys? What are y'all What are y'all doing? Uh, I've been painting a lot. I've been trying to trying to read, but I usually read during my commutes. So it's not that I don't want to read. It's just I don't think about reading. Though recently I've been trying to read a little bit more just because I want to get like informed. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been like painting. I redecorated my room. So, read, so, you, so you're reading on the train? Is that like? Yeah, I would read yeah. on the train going places. So I was like reading like a book a week, but then I have no reason to ride the train. So right there goes my 2020 book goals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no recovering from that now. So I'm just gonna start all over. <laughs> it starts from now. The next book goal. <laughs> so. But for me, I've just been, um, honestly, I've been trying to recapture a, a love for listening to music. Mm -hmm. So I've just been, because a lot of times I don't listen for enjoyment. So I've been listening to a lot of records and, and you know, I'm playing, I'm on the horn too, um, and just keeping up every day. But really the listening thing is really trying to work on that stuff. It's, very it's like cool. the break that in theory you should have after school, right? <laughs> and we're just lucky because we got it sooner and you're not getting it till now bro. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, um, it's tough. It's like, you, you know, it, it, on one side, it's a really good thing that like your job is what you love, but there's another side to that is, is sometimes it's just hard to distinguish. It's hard to remember it, it, you know, it's hard to multitask while you're doing something. So if you're listening to something and you're trying to like, you know, zap some of the energy from it for your playing, it's it's like the the part of your brain that's like, man, I like love this, and this is this is like fueling me. Mm-hmm. It it doesn't remind you of that, you know. Right. Exactly. I want to start uh, with you know, kind of talking about you first, and one of the themes that we have because you know, a lot of the listeners are bass trombonists who are trying to get into jazz bass trombone is like the whole starting late thing. And you started playing when you were trombone when you were 17 and then you like went to Juilliard and then you just kicked ass basically for the rest of eternity. So um, for the listeners, (laughs) can you talk to us a little bit about like how that was for you and just go through the process with us because I even I would love to hear it again. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, you know, I wish I felt like it was kicking ass. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, starting late is is a big theme in my life. Uh, you know, I, I've I've always felt like a little late in, in just everything. I don't know if the people listening or if you guys can relate to that. Like, it's not just in music, but you know, like late to the kickball field. Uh, <laughs> like if you, we moved around a lot as a kid, so I would be the guy, I would be the kid joining the class in second grade and everybody's been friends since kindergarten that, you know, or paying dues for a field trip or anything. Any, it's just late, late was just kind of a thing. You know, when I started uh, saxophone, I, w- I was in fifth grade. And, and so I was, that was like the, one of the first times that I actually felt like, Hey, I'm at the beginning here with everybody else. So this is cool. And <clears throat> I switched to a, I went from like a Christian private school to a public magnet school at sixth grade called Davidson Fine Arts. And there I, I joined beginning band in that school as well. And that was a really good experience for me. And, and I'll never forget, uh, I liked playing, I liked sort of improvising with the march themes and the, and the wind ensemble notes. So, and I also love cartoons. So, uh, Bugs Bunny was Warner Brothers was always happening, you know, in my house. And you know, at the end, sometimes you know they'll do like the, uh, you know, they'll do, uh, they'll do like the and many more thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, and I did that in a rehearsal, like after a big, like long piece, you know, big big march or whatever. And and many more, just me solo. And uh, nobody laughed. Nobody liked it. <laughs> oh, no. It's like the, it was like the first of a long le- legendary list of jokes that just fall flat. You know? <laughs> um, but my band director was like, Mike, Michael, you can't do that. That's horrible. And, you know, save that for the jazz band. I'll never forget that. And, <laughs> I was like, what is this jazz band where I can, I can do this? Anyway, so long, long story short, I got interested in jazz band and I joined and, and we played a lot of rock music and, you know, it was, it was some more, more like a rock stage band than, than, than you know, American Dad. You know, the, 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 three, the three tunes um, that we played most often was Chicago Blues, um, a very, very basic arrangement. We played vehicle. You know, it's rock, rock tune. And, um, and Green Onions, right? Oh, nice. Yeah, Booker T, that was, yeah. That was our first hit. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I didn't really know what was happening with, with jazz. And, and, and I had a couple friends that were that had, were making all state jazz in Georgia. And they, they seemed to know more, a lot more than I did, uh, which always made me feel a little embarrassed or insecure about it. So my mom 
can tell that my hobby is getting to be like saxophone oriented. And, and, and so she's from Brooklyn, New York. We actually named our, our first daughter Brooklyn after my mom's hometown. And, and so she says, here, son, here's a CD. Um, this is Charlie Parker. And you're going to be a saxophone. If you're going to play music, you're going to be a saxophone player. You got to know who Charlie Parker is. Like, that's just, that's a requirement. You know, it's like if you're going to be in a pool and you have to have water, you know, or if you're going to have a sandwich, then you need some sort of grain or starch or bread, right? If you're going to play saxophone, you got to know Charlie Parker. And that, that like resonated with me um, uh, because it turns out my mom was right. <laughs> you know, mothers are right about things. And, and, and I heard that CD and it was just kind of like witchcraft, you know, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, I still didn't know what the hell was going on because uh, it, it was so advanced to me. Uh, and I was listening to Kenny G on the radio and imitating, you know, smooth jazz and things like that. So I just, I didn't really have like a good connection point with it. I promise this is going to get to bass trombone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm sort of like grappling with saxophone and yada, yada, yada. And, and, and I did start getting into Sonny Rollins, saxophone Colossus. And I was playing tenor at that point. Uh, this is 16 years old. Um, also, in between there, we don't need to talk about it because I, I taught myself trumpet when I was uh, uh, in 10th grade. But but that's a whole different. We don't we don't want, we don't want to talk about. It. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, a friend of mine plays me. Uh, his name's Dan. Dan is a guitarist, and he's an attorney now in Germany. A successful one, I think, and and he says, Mike, if you if you if you're gonna listen to jazz, man, you gotta listen to Train. And I was like, Train? I never heard of John Coltrane. And so we, he he gives me the record Blue Train, and we're listening to it in the car and CD player. You know, the saxophone solo begins. You know, and I said, Wow, that's really different. It doesn't sound to me like Sonny Rollins at all. Um, and the trumpet begins, and I said, Well, that reminds me of Clifford Brown. He says, well, it's Lee Morgan. And I said, great. And then the trombone plays, and I'm just like, what is that instrument? I have no idea what that is. You know, I've never, never heard of them. Is that a baritone horn? He says, no, that's a trombone. And, and I said, you're kidding. I, I know what a trombone sounds like. It does not sound like that. You're, you're mistaken, sir. And, and, he, and he, says, uh, he says, no, man, that's the trombonist. Curtis Fuller is really great. And I just, I just had like a, an overcome moment, you know, a call to, to Jesus or God or, or uh, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's a cultural reference for every moment. Epiphany, you know, it could be whatever, a miracle. Revelation. Uh, revelation, yeah. That was my, like, musical miracle, is that I, I was interested enough and I was armed with enough knowledge to like be able to hear something and I might not know what's happening but I know I like it but this was so much above that it was like I love like love at first sight I just I heard that sound and I heard the playing and I said I said uh I'm doing the wrong thing you know uh the saxophone is if, if that's if, if a trombone can sound like that then I need to be playing trombone so yeah. I had I had just turned uh, seventeen. This is a uh, end of August in in uh, nineteen ninety nine. Um, so yeah, pretty late, you know. Uh, how how so that's how I got there. Uh, the the very next day I went to school and I asked I told my band director I said, Mister Catterjohn, I heard the trombone played like it could never be played before. I need to play a trombone can I please switch to trombone? He goes, no, you know, <laughs> this is hard, hard no, just to straight, just crush my dreams, you know? So, so I was like, uh, well, I'm not going to play saxophone at school anymore. And he goes, you have to play saxophone. And, uh, and I said, well, I'm not going to play. So, so we, we had sort of like a standoff and he, and he let me, he let me join, um, intermediate band which is one step above above beginner band and and behind the scenes like i'm like shedding all the time like 
falling asleep with the trombone. That's, that's, that's my biggest re remembrance of, the, of those times is I would come home and practice, eat dinner, practice, um, practice, and then fall asleep and wake up terrified that I had like messed, like my trombone had fallen off the bed or something. Like I remember several times waking up and just like almost in tears that I had messed up my trombone. Aww. It was the only one I had, you know? And, and yeah, so, so, so yeah, being, being behind and, and not having a teacher at that point, I mean, I really just, I copied the, those solos that inspired me so much. Curtis Fuller, JJ Johnson. Later I got a Bill Watchers record and I just sat and I tried to play all the notes on the horn every day. And this is the sort of the early internet days of, I would go on websites like Robin Eubanks and, and Conrad Herwig's site and, and read and see if I could find interviews. Um, there was a, a, there's a website, it's still around called the Online Trombone Journal. Mm -hmm. And I just, I would, every interview, I've probably read every possible interview on that, on that website, trying to figure out, there's so much you can figure out on your own. That's why Chris and I have our little, you know, did you Google PDF? Of the of the lead sheet joke, you know, it, it's it's because I was so like I you know I didn't really have any help, so I had to I had to figure it out or I wasn't going to get it. Yeah, and and that's the uh, I mean the sort of the undercurrent of that time is that things were really tough at my house. Uh, my dad had walked out and sort of left me and my mom with with nothing. She was um, looking for work at the time, and and so really really tough you know music became my sort of refuge against that it, it, it let me sort of pour more pour more of myself into it so I, I always say like if you can connect your practice and your music to your story to your personal story um and if you can if you can use competition in a good way in a positive way rather than using competition as a hammer to smite your em enemies with <laughs> <laughs> that's negative. You know, you know, like when my band director said, no, that was, that just like set me off. And I was like, no one tells me, no, you know, no one tells me. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not, that's not like how I felt, but I was like, I was really enraged really. Cause I had, you know, fallen in love with the instrument. And I, and I was like, you'll be sorry. <laughs> not, not, not quite, but, but, um, but kind of, you know? Um, yeah. So, so like having a late start can, can actually be, can actually be beneficial because it just, you know, it sort of limits your options for BSing. Yeah. You know, like I didn't have as much time to like twiddle my thumbs is, but yeah, I, I just, I, I kind of had to just go with it and make it happen. I was terrified of like the big stars and jazz and, but I, I sat and made myself write an email to Robin Eubanks and I actually got the nerve to call Wycliffe Gordon on the phone. Wow. And, and I was like, I was so scared cause I'm a, I'm a shy person. And, and, and I, and I'm like, you know, I, I never think I'm good enough. So I was like, man, I'm totally wasting their time and, and uh, they're, they're just going to laugh at me, but, but, if I didn't call, then I might not get the help I needed. So, so the, the love, like always coming back to like the, that I really love this is, is, has been super helpful in dealing with being sort of a late comer to jazz, to the trombone, certainly to the bass trombone. That's actually my short answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think you guys probably know that. That's a, that is the short answer. <laughs> short answer. One thing that I really appreciated about learning from you is that oftentimes we hear from our, from people in the bass trombone world that playing the bass trombone is really difficult and that becoming somebody who plays jazz on bass trombone is like a big obstacle. But can you talk a little bit about how when we were students, you helped us overcome it by just making us do it regardless. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I'm glad you guys feel that way. The, um, the bass trombone, you, you know, this is just one man's thoughts, you know, mm -hmm. so 
Uh, but I'm entitled to my thoughts too. <laughs> so I'm, if, if people disagree, it's fine. Um, you know, uh, I think that whatever stigma, if there even is one about the bass trombone or the not soloing or not playing bebop or, and, and it doesn't have to just be bebop. Bebop's awesome, but so is fusion. So is trad jazz. So is new Orleans music. So, so is anything, you know? I mean, bebop is just kind of right there in the middle. Yeah. Um, I think that that it's it's a it's an issue of unfamiliarity. All right. It's like people don't know how to process what they've never heard. You know, so it's not fair if someone's never heard a jazz bass trombonist, like you know, really get inside the chords. You know you know, place a really slick melody, intervallic things, you know, you know, deal with the rhythm on the level of a, of a jazz master. Um, they just haven't heard it because, because uh, not a lot of people have done it or can do it, mm-hmm. you know, because bass trombone is an unwieldy instrument. I think we could all agree. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not for y'all, not for your previous guests, you know, but, um, but for a lot of people like getting around and, you know, in the basement, you know, so, so to speak is, is a challenge. It's, it's, you know, you got to connect everything. The air has got to move. You have to, you know, you have to hear, you know, we have to hear the notes before they're played uh, because we have less helpers like keys and buttons. I, that's what, that's what I think. So I think the answer is actually in what you guys are doing is to do it and do it at a high level and let people make up their minds, you know, People haven't had a chance to make up their minds about about what the bass trombone sounds like, like ripping on a solo or playing, you know, you know, they've they've had their minds made up about beautiful ballad playing, Mm -hmm. right? Because George Roberts is revered all across the world in time. You know, I I know that when I you know, in like just say in your cases, I've heard great feedback about um, your your tricketism video, Gina. And And I've, and I've seen people, you know, be really into, uh, like Chris, if, if, you know, you're taking a solo and I've had people come up to me and say, man, not knowing I'm your teacher, say, man, Trevor player sounds great. You know, I go, and then I go, you must have a great teacher. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just, I'm just playing, but, um, people need a chance. the, The short of it is that people need a chance to hear it. And it not and it and the more people that play jazz on the bass trombone, and the and the more frequent it gets, and the higher the overall level gets, the more there the more chance there w- will be for a fair decision to be made by listeners. Mm-hmm. You know that, that that's all I want in my life. I want to be heard. Like make my case. That, that's that's what I think. That's what you know human beings want. They want to be heard. You know, in your relationships, do you hear me? Do you hear what I'm saying? You know, with my colleagues, I mean, I understand you. Do you understand me? Can we understand together? You know, with your music, you know, do you hear what these chord changes are saying? Do you hear what this melody is communicating? We all want to be heard. And it's hard for people to have any opinion about about something's value or relevance or cool factor, or even if it's poopy. You know, if they can't hear it. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. Totally. That that's the that's the that's the real bear of the issue. You know, I, I remember hearing getting to New York and hearing Max Seigel play, and I was like, Whoa, why doesn't everybody do this? You know? And then I picked up a bass trombone and I was like, blah blah. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Oh, that's <laughs> I have a question because one time in studio class, you said something that really kind of messed me up a little bit. It was a really simple thing, but you said the trombone is never going to be easy, but you can practice it enough and get to the point of relaxation where it's second nature. And I feel like that's, that's like a really good representation of like your playing where it looks effortless, but obviously it took a lot of work to get there. Can you talk a little bit about what you meant by that? Oh man. Well, I'd like to know what I meant by that. (laughs) (laughs) 
you were no, trying to yeah. you were trying to get us because uh like we were like trying to learn something in 12 keys oh yeah get really tense and you're like no relax and then we're like but it's not easy you're like yeah but it's never it's never going to be easy but you still have to relax yeah 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 that's a that's a good context um the uh and i was i was also kidding i remember what i'm <laughs> but, damn but but no <laughs> you, you have to give time for my 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 dead <laughs> pass okay right you hip to that chris you have to let the dead pan sit for that's just a you know, but, but no, but no, I appreciate the context actually, because that's, that's um, now I, rem I remember that moment. But so again, my, you know, my thought about this is that, um, you know, that that's something I, I remember when I first started playing and people, all I heard about was how hard the trombone is, you know, how trombone's hard. There's not many trombonists. It's unique among instruments. It's, you know, it's just the only harder instruments to double bass in. Ta-da! <laughs> no, the, uh, <laughs> The, uh, you know, and I just got tired of it, you know, and, and, and I used to, I used to sort of like rebel against that idea and, and think like, eh, it's not hard, you know, that's not hard. And, and I didn't realize that that approach was actually helping me practice mm -hmm. um, because it was, it was taming my nerves as I, as I sat down with the horn. You know, rather than picking up this instrument and being like, oh, no, it's going to be hard. You know, <laughs> rather than sort of approaching it from fear, I approached it from sort of like, come here. You're going to sound great. All right. Air, right. It's all we need. Just, just a big tube. Boom. Right. You know, and I don't mean to make it sound flippant, um, but I have to have sort of a, a way to think about something that that's why I use so many analogies because they really help me, you know, get out of the, you know, nuts and bolts, you know, components and pounds per pressure and square inch. I mean, I, I want to know more about how something feels than every tiny detail about of what it is. All right. The details are fine. Like I'll get those later. Um, and I want to understand those, but, I need to know how it feels. And, and for me, when, when I tell myself, when I constantly reinforce that I'm trying to make this instrument feel easy, it changes my focus and it, and it relaxes me and it lets me put my best self in the practice session. So, so these things like, you know, you know, a great example is take, taking like a little, a little um, cell of an idea, right? Um, it could be whatever you want. It could be if we're if we're doing um earlier jazz, you know, be do 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 do, you know, something like that, you know. So it's so it's funny when you take that in the first key, do 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 right? You go great, do 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 do. So that's E flat now, right? Then then if we go to A flat, do 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 do, right? Then we go to cycle of fourths, right? So D flat. Do, 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 do. That's, that's cool. So that's four, right? But as we get to the more unfamiliar keys, especially for younger players, now this really natural approach to playing becomes, you know, you know, I mean, how many times have, I mean, how many times have I done it, right? How many times have you guys done it? Everybody, that's like a normal thing. So you have to have some ammunition to, to like fight against that, you know? And, and what is it? It's, it? To me, it's like thinking around the corner. It's like, okay, I'm not gonna punish myself because these keys are unfamiliar. You know, I know why they're unfamiliar because I don't practice like triads and half steps in the keys of E, B, F sharp. You know, I don't practice those all the time. So you can't look at that that the way that you play those off the cuff as an indicator of whether an instrument is hard or not, you know, it's actually easy, but you have to get to the easy part in here before it becomes easy here. So, so same thing with like long tones and air and, 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 and all that stuff, you know, that, that helps differentiate between tension and firmness, you know, tightness and support, you know, those are, you know, two sides of the same coin. You know, I find a lot of players that are like tight and tense. 
And then I tell them, no, support firm. And they're like, but that's the same thing. It's not the same thing because you're not thinking of them differently. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's a hard, that's a, you know, that concept takes a lot of like um, patience and, and, and stillness. You guys ever seen the movie Wishmaster? Mm -mm. Oh, you got to watch 1997's greatest movie. Uh, Wishmaster is about uh, an evil djinn that uh, is awa awakened uh, by the cracking of the so sorcerer's stone and he grants three wishes and upon the granting of the third wish the legions of the djinn will transfer and, and into this um, into our world and enslave humanity um, anyway it's a horror movie it's great I encourage you to watch it but the the protagonist who defeats the djinn um, she's a basketball coach and she teaches her girls stillness and that's how you you know you take a breath you're calm and all of a sudden something really stressful and hard becomes easy and then you make the shot so it's the same thing I mean so I watch a horror movie which is completely stupid <laughs> and I take away I'm, I'm probably not taking away what the movie director intended, <laughs> but like, I always see these like relationships b between things. And so Wishmaster, believe it or not, has made me like a more efficient and, and a careful trombonist. And it could for you too, if you watch it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, cause you have had so many trombone students, but you've also had, a good amount of bass drum on students now. Yeah. 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 So my question for you is what do you think is different about bass trombone jazz bass jazz bass trombone pedagogy if there's anything different than like just versus jazz trombone pedagogy? It's um it's different in the sense that it's I I think there's a challenge in bass trombonists hearing themselves fit in an ensemble be because there's there, there's less models you know i mean there you know for for part playing and for ensemble playing hey you guys have interviewed them all you guys that there's a million examples of how to do this you know mm -hmm. but when it comes time to like really saying something melodically on like stella by starlight or, or or some you know evergreen standard right or like an album you know where you're like engaged and the low notes aren't you know, don't sound gimmicky or, you know, everything's not just one style or th there's just not, a, th that hasn't been done a whole lot. And, and so I think it can be, whereas a tenor trombonist, you know, you, you sit down and you just look around and it's like, you, you know, Jack Teagarden showed us how to go this way. Jimmy Cleveland did this and lived in LA and worked in the studio scenes and, you know, played really hip arrangements, worked with Cannonball. You got Mike Davis, who's in New York. I mean, he's, you know, he's classically trained and, and, you know, writes all these great charts. He plays with the Rolling Stones. I mean, you have all these models as a tenor trombonist of like, of like what to do. You could be like Melba Liston, you could tour big bands, um, if that ever starts up again. You could, you know, write, write charts. You can get a mentor. I mean, Quincy Jones was one of her mentors. Um, you have all these models about how to do things and where to go and which, what it could be like. And in and, and jazz, as a bass trombonist, um, as a soloist especially, like that, that hasn't presented itself yet. We really need that to be, you know, present at some point. Mm -hmm. now, I think that happened with J.J. Uh, Johnson, where, where he, uh, his, his style adapted his sophisticated approach adapted so well to the way dizzy and bird were playing these melodies and their in their pitches and and how it assimilated in the style it's not that like other trombonists weren't ridiculous but um but like the style the voice leading the rhythmic concept in bebop is is different than you know the the swing era that preceded it it's just different and he, JJ was willing to figure out that formula to get his melodies and his solos, um, 
you know, sounding uh, feng shui, so to speak, you know? And, and so I, th I think the time's come, I mean, you know, y'all are doing, I mean, people are, are, are doing it and it just needs to, to get out there more. Yeah. Can you talk about any possible lessons that you've learned in being one of the few that does jazz based trombone pedagogy? Yeah. The, um, you, you know, there, there's some tenets that I think are, you know, kind of like pillars of, of preparing someone to, to, to do this or, or to be successful. Uh, one of them obviously is doubling a big part of, uh, being a musician, being a successful musician is being able to gig, mm -hmm. you, know? you know, being able to double makes you available for, for more than you would if you just specialize in one instrument. Mm -hmm. And the bass trombone is one of those that, uh, you know, the, the bass trombone has become a double for tenor trombonists. So, so I think, you know, having your tenor trombone chops um, ready and available and up to a, up to a good level, I think that's very helpful. Obviously, uh, tuba, right, Gina, got your tuba there. Yep. Um, and the, and the, you know, the common keys of these instruments, I mean, the B flat, the C and the, you know, sometimes the E flat tuba, uh, with, with tenor trombone, uh, being able to play, a you know, a 500 bore instrument, a, a small bore and a, uh, symphony bore size, uh, if, if the need arises, uh, I think that's like very important. Uh, I think a lot of Broadway shows use doubling trombonists. So, I mean, to, to, to be able to, to do that is a prerequisite, certainly. And, and then too, you never, you never know like what opportunity will, what an opportunity will require of you. I mean, I've had, you know, several in my life, uh, you know, where I've had people call me and, and say like, bring your bass trombone, I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> I guess I should get a bass trombone, you know? And if, and if you want the work, then you figure it out uh, and you make yourself, you know, viable for that. I mean, if you don't do it, then you can't do it, you know? Uh, so, so that's, that's, that's a big one. Um, you know, ba bass trombone, it's a part of the trombone family. So, so all of the history and the role that, that the trombone has had in jazz since the very beginning, that's all in play. And that's all something, you know, just, just because you have a trigger or two doesn't mean that you don't learn and assimilate glissandos and tailgate playing and, uh, and turns and lip trills and, you know, all the accoutrement of, of, of jazz style and inflections and, and, and playing. Um, it's a little harder because things are farther apart on the bass trombone than they are on the tenor trombone. And I think a lot of what you learn on the tenor is, is appropriate and transitions over to the bass. Well, one of the things that, you know, that I'm, I work on with uh, one of my current bass trombone students, Wyatt, for him on, and it's something I, w I actually wish I had more time with you guys to, to get into is is dealing with like different style approaches because that that's one of the things that's so special about jazz to me um is that there's, there's really so much to cover and <laughs> so much to learn it's it's like uh i remember i had a teacher one time uh tell me he said just learn bebop if you can learn bebop you can do anything and i remember thinking that was really cool at the time i was also 18 I didn't know anything um, and and I get what where he was coming from with that that bebop uh, voice leading and and the relationships of chord progressions and the virtuosity required for the melodies and the rhythm you know sometimes the tempos of the tunes um, that if you can get all those plates spinning at once then you know you've developed quite a skill set the problem with a with a bebop first mentality is that it is that musically it can put on your blinders you know and and bebop is like where it's at and and bebop is where it's at <laughs> but it's not only where it's at and i think that's a challenge 
with all students, whatever they're checking out. If you're into odd meters and, you know, major sevens, sharp five chords and slash chords and, and, you know, ticky ticky on the drums, <laughs> you know, you know uh, non-traditional straight ahead, non straight ahead jazz. If you're into that, that that's everything, you know, it's like, I'm only listening to these type of cats. I'm only hip to this type of sound. And, you, and I think students miss something when they don't like, when they don't learn about the history of the art that they're working on. But at the same time, if you, let's say you get into, to, you know, big band playing and it's like those cats are just on the Mount Rushmore of jazz for you. You know, it's Dorsey, it's Jack Jenny, you know, it's Fred Beckett, Dickie Wells. It's like, oh my goodness, that's, gosh, mwah, if I could, if I could play like that, that's all I would ever want. And it's, that's cool. And, and we need people that love something so deeply to specialize in it. But if you're trying to develop yourself as a player that can do more than one thing so that you can get more than one type of gig, then those blinders, those musical preferences that are so, that are so important for you to exclude other styles, they're going to limit you. And so, so when people are learning to get around on the instrument, uh, you know, as much of a help as bebop can be, you know, if you're not smart and careful with it, bebop can also be a lock. <laughs> it can be a lock on the door to other styles, mm -hmm. you know? So if you're playing like not even that far ahead of bebop, but like, let's say like eye of the hurricane, you know, or dolphin dance, or you're playing, um, Nosmo King, you know, to go even further. Um, uh, or, or, or you're playing, uh, or if you go even further back, you know, if you're playing like, you know, um, dirty dog blues or something, it's like bebop will teach you how to like get through the chords. Bebop will have you playing, you know, syncopated and interesting rhythms, but bebop is going to miss the style of those tunes. It's like, uh, you know, I almost want to think of it like, uh, how different eras in our history and our like world history have different phrases and, and, uh, you know, different, <laughs> you know, like, like my mom, my mom used to say this word, super Murgatroyd. You ever heard of that? Mm -mm. Well, she grew up in the seventies and, um, like sixties and seventies. And, and that was a word that means cool or like awesome. Or, uh, do you guys ever say rad? R A D rad. Oh, it's rad. Sometimes, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, well, that was that was all the time when I was a kid. Like every like if rad was like one of the hot words, you know, like every every little point in time has its like distinguishing characteristics, mm -hmm. and so that's something that you know a, a lot of the a lot of the um, bass trombonists that I've had the pleasure of working with over the years, uh, you know, they benefit immensely from that foundation that bebop playing provides but it's just one thing yeah. and i think i think that's really important to, to 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 work on with bass trombone players so when i have somebody like with wyatt you know he's starting his third year so so we've been dealing with bebop um exclusively in his second year so his third year is gonna you know venture out of the um late 40s mm -hmm. and into a whole different ball game that's important. Equipment's important. You know, um, you know, when you have as much tubing and, and piping and, and ball bearings and things, you know, it's, it's important to have a, have like a dependable horn. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think for, for younger players, like having a horn that will not break down as much is, is really important. You know, like that's, Get a sturdy horn. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. And other than that, you know, um, they're, you know, jazz based trombone students are, are jazz students. Mm -hmm. So they're privy and will benefit from the entire, you know, echelon of, of American music, not just jazz. 
a lot, a lot of a lot of the most interesting and coolest gigs that I've I've had the pleasure of doing have had zero jazz <laughs> on them. Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, and and the skills that you learn studying jazz, like listening, having good intonation, matching articulations, um, you know, change maybe changing mouthpieces for a little different sound. Um, uh, listening to cutoffs to be, you know, perfectly uh, getting dynamics together. All these things that are really crucial to being a successful big band and small ensemble player. These things, these things are super important in in pop music. Being being at a record date where somewhere trumpet players like, you know, play this, and then you're like. <laughs> like yeah okay you know and then if you don't get it the first time it's there might be a vibe mm-hmm. so so uh you know just 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 remembering as a, as a bass trombone is that like you know yeah you're you're you are special in the sense that like there's more undiscovered country for for this instrument instrument i felt that way as a trombonist i was like wow like I can sort of count on these on, on my two hands, like sort of the big name trombonists, like from the seventies on, you know, like, like the, the ones that toured all the time and, and made their own recordings. There's not, not a whole lot of them, you know, and, and, and I, and I like that to be honest, like I like sort of to, to, to feel like a part of a little smaller group. So you talked a little bit about doubling and you're kind of like a doubling wizard because you play, what is it? You play bass, you play trumpet, you play all the saxophones, trombone, or you were shedding drums last I heard. He picked up a tuba too. I've heard him play some tuba. Now there's a tuba, yeah. So (laughs) do you have any advice for young musicians who are, well, I mean, because it's, you know, doubling is time consuming and it's difficult to pick up another instrument, but uh, could you talk to us a little bit about any advice you have for doubling, especially um, as it relates to learning instruments in different families. Hmm. Yeah, that's great. Good question. The, um, you know, get a teacher. Get a teacher. Uh, it it can be fun. Uh, I, I mean, I'm the poster child for like play around with an instrument on your own. I mean, that's <laughs> how I became a musician. But 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 like for instance, right now I have a bass teacher. You know, I, I get a lesson every two weeks and it just, it saves so much time because, because I don't, I don't want to make the mistake of figuring out something incorrectly. Yeah. Um, I did that with the trombone actually. When I moved to New York, I couldn't play above a mezzo piano uh, without cracking the note. And I had never played a pedal tone in my life. Like I could play, I could play a low E, but you know, coming to the trombone so late, I didn't understand, you know, it's a, it's a different blow to play pedal notes. Mm-hmm. And, and if you learn that as a kid, like, it's like, ah, you know, but <laughs> to tell, like, to tell someone that's almost like a legal adult, just flop your lips and a low, a giant low note will come out <laughs> register to me at all. So I didn't learn how to play a pedal note until I was in Juilliard. And I had to do what I sort of call like a remedial summer. Like I got a I got a gig on a cruise ship, and I just practiced all the fundamentals that I had learned from from the year. And um, I want to give a, a little shout out too to Ryan Keverly because he he uh, he was really helpful for me. You know, Ryan was sort of like an all star student at Juilliard. He's got you know mad perfect pitch. Grew up with a lot of training. His, his dad's a trumpet player and a professor, and he plays great organ and piano. Uh, it's got a great band called Catharsis, but Ryan, I remember just watching him and sort of being in awe. And I was like, man, this guy is only like two or three years old than me, but he's got so much together. And, and I, and he used to do this thing that pissed me off so, so much. We laugh about it now, but whenever I would like mess up a note in, in big band, you know, just cause I couldn't play it. It's, it's really dumb. You know, I, I couldn't. You know, it'd be like, play a B flat on mezzo forte. I'd be like, because <laughs> I, I just, I was so used to playing soft um, because I had taught myself, you know, 
Ryan would laugh. He would just chuckle. I'd be like, man, that sucks. And he would go, <laughs> and then slap me on the leg with his, with his hand, just like, like an affectionate slap. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just remember like, man, this guy's like making fun of me. You know, I, 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 I suck, man. I'm just like the worst. And, and, but, but like, like I said, like I, I, I humbled myself and I, and I asked him if he would ever give me some help. And he was like, yeah, be happy to come over, come over to my apartment and let's, let's just play and hang. And he, uh, I, I went over, he made this great like, chicken cordon bleu because he's a gourmet. And, and he, he basically ex explained, he's like, man, you know, this is how you work on long tones. This is, this is um, how you learn tunes. And these are the tunes that you need to learn. And I mean, really cool. So that, that's like sort of my long way of saying like be really careful when you start a new instrument because you might have to scratch everything you did, <laughs> you know, get some help. Even if it's just like a hang, like call up somebody that, you know, that does it really well. Um, like my trumpet playing, I, I, you know, I'm not a, a, the trumpet player that I am as a trombonist, but, but I can play a little bit and, and I can work professionally on it. And I have, but years ago, I went and got a lesson with David Smith, who's a fantastic trumpet player, and lives in Brooklyn, and he teaches at the Hart School now. But we used to play in this band, um, uh, Howard Williams' big band, and he was shredding, just shredding trumpet, you know, it's like Woody Shaw, you know. And, and I was like, man, if, if, if anyone can teach me how to practice trumpet, it's this guy, you know. So that's like number one. Um, you know, number two is, is do some research, get a decent doubling equipment, get a decent instrument. Mm -hmm. um, don't fall for the eBay internet, uh, cheap instruments that won't play in tune and fall apart. And I bought a cheap trombone one time and I was playing, I picked up the trombone and the main tuning slide just slid out, hit the floor. <laughs> and uh, I, I, you know, because what happens is when they ship the instruments, sometimes they use a thin oil rather than a thick oil mm -hmm. to, pr to prevent corrosion. So what you're supposed to do is when you get the horn, wipe it down, then reapply like the, the petroleum jelly thickness. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know to do that because I didn't ask anybody. So I just, this the horn just fell out of my hands. Like, damn. Um, get a good instrument. Um, uh, figure out the basics. Like one of the, one of the first things I did on trombone was I figured out how to how to play every note. Like once you can figure out your scale, like your your extreme registers, right? Like where's your meat and potatoes range of the instrument? You know that's you know work on your extremes, work on your meat and potatoes, and then work on connecting everything you know, easily and, and, and uh, with a good sound. And that's basically like every instrument, yeah. you know, and, and your range will improve. I mean, that's an air control thing. Uh, your sound will improve. That's a time thing. Um, and, and then, uh, and then one, once you've got those fundamentals happening, you know, it's time for the tuner, mm -hmm. like learn to play that thing in tune. I mean, that's, that's so important. Um, cause if it's not in tune, you basically can't use it. Yeah. Um, attacks, you know, figure out on, on said instrument, what type of attacks do you need? Do you need breath attacks? Do you, do you need to know how to do, you know, full on marcado, you know, bing, zing, pop, biff, wham, like what kind of attacks do you need to work on this instrument? You know, those, those are the fundamentals and, uh, and, uh, you know, some advice that, that was given to me is, 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 you know, be, be careful about when you, when you demonstrate your doubling, you know, because first impressions are important, <laughs> you know, um, cause it's really easy to, um, I, th I think people, People can only really 
work with the information that you give them. You know, so I don't know what type of um, accordion player you are until you play it. Mm-hmm. You know, and if you're playing it and you're and you're really trying to to get somewhere on it, but then you play and you show me where you're at before you're ready. That's fine if I'm your friend, but if I'm someone thinking of hiring an accordion player, <laughs> you not, you might not be on my list. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So just just be careful. It's it's like um. Like, I think it's, I know for me, like, I get excited about playing doubles. So I just, I just want to like play as much as possible. And, 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 and I remember getting really sensitive because I, I, I heard, you know, my, my teachers or, you know, people around me say, oh man, he's showing off and yada, yada, yada. And it's, it's just, oh, you can play anything. And, you know, I had, I figured out later that a lot of that insecurity is on them, mm-hmm. not not me, because you know sometimes being excited and playing and showing off look the same, but but they're not. Yeah. You know, so if you care about how something looks to people, then you might, regardless of your intention, you just might adjust it. So you know, I used to just get on every instrument and play, and and. I decided when I started becoming a professional that I wasn't going to do that. And, and that, that was, that ultimately was like really helpful. Now in this phase of my life, I'm actually doubling, I'm doubling more than ever, you know, and, and a lot of it is because I don't care what people think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so you just have to, you just have to, um, you know, you have to take in and, and consider like your situation all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I was uh, I was on a gig once where uh, lead trombonist got sensitive because I was warming up in the upper register, and uh, and and somebody somebody told me said, "Yeah, man, you might want to cool it with the high notes, man. You're not the lead player." And I was like, "Man, this is why I like being a jazz soloist, <laughs> so I, I don't have to deal with with so much insecurity and." And, you know, so sometimes jealousy too. So, mm-hmm. you know, but that, that's a, that's a thing. Like you just, you just need to, there's no, I don't think there's like a set answer for everybody. You just have to like figure out the answer that works for you. Yeah. You know, w- one of the things about my, uh, you know, my, my career is that my goals kept changing, you know, and, and, and sometimes really quickly, you know, like, like when I was 15, like my goal was like, oh, I just want to major in music. That would be so awesome. If I could study music in college, man, that would be just the best. Oh my God. Wow. You know, and in the scholarship, oh, you know, so, so I did that and I was like, I don't care where I go to school. As long as I study music, I don't need a trombone teacher. I just, I just, you know, just jazz would be great. So I found a jazz program, but they didn't have a trombone teacher. So that didn't last very long. I was like, well, I want to change that. Um, now, now I, if I could just have a jazz teacher, it would be so great. You know? <laughs> and then I got, uh, I got to New York, I had a jazz teacher. And then uh, that was great, but then I wanted some gigs. So I was like, if I could just have a gig, I don't care what style, any style, I just, if I could just, you know. <laughs> so, so, um, so yeah, I got a, I got a gig. And then I started doing uh, block parties and weddings, bar mitzvahs, you name it, you know, all that, all that stuff. And then I was like, well, this is great, but if I could just play more jazz. That would... mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so like this, this, this thing, uh, you know, and I, and I always taught, I always had students and then I was like, if I could just be at a, like a university, I was like, if I could just be in a program with, J-, you know, mm-hmm. so, so that, that type of, I think it's okay, like to, to like figure out what, what you, what you want on the fly. And, and every, every like path is, is, is a little different. You know, one of the things that I've, that I had to learn is like, like different, different trajectories have different, different sort of gas stations, <laughs> if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, like um, for for some gigs, 
you need a trombonist to like put a word in for you, you know, or you need, you, you need, you know, to make this networking opportunity or, you know, hook something up. And, and I certainly had some of that. Um, I remember James Burton sent me on my first, my, my first sub and, and that ended up, uh, I ended up joining the band, Illinois Jaquette's big band. Uh, but after that, a lot of my gigs didn't come from trombone players. You know, they came from directly from the artist, you know, who, who usually wasn't a trombonist. <laughs> and, and that's just, that's just like a, a, a different thing. So like, like for instance, I think Broadway is very, very different. I think that, that the scene is, is, is like a network of the, the particular instruments and the relationships of, of people like subbing and personalities and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I know, for instance, I, I, I mailed Slide Hampton my CD and, and he was, he was fantastic. He's, he's one of the great, all time great supporters of trombone players. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, if, if all of us were half as supportive as Slide Hampton is of each other, then there'd be a trombonist in every gig. That's just the fact, you know? <laughs> so, um, so that was, he, he put me in on a gig at the Vanguard, like a, literally a week before the gig, never having heard of me or known me from anybody. And that was, that was a really cool way for me to meet, you know, a lot of the elite players in jazz all in like a week's, a week span. Mm -hmm. So we talked a bit about, especially when you were talking about learning an instrument that you need a teacher and you talked about how Frank Cavalier was really helpful in your development on the instrument. Can you talk a little bit about mentorship and how, what that means to you? If I didn't have mentors, you know, I, I just, I wouldn't have made it. Uh, and that's not to absolve myself of any kudos, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, but I, I also, I also believe that like your mentors don't fall in your lap. You know, I think, you, I think you have to go look for them sometimes. And sometimes the best things for you come from a, a lot of work <laughs> rather, rather than like, this is within reach. Yeah. Uh, so, so I, you know, I could just tell you like a start out by telling you like the, the people that I consider like my sort of my big teachers, which is, uh, my, uh, I had a high school choir director. Um, his name's uh, Dr. James Dunaway. And he was an all-state trombonist. He was cool. I sang in choir in 12th grade. And, and he would actually listen to me play trombone and give me tips. And, and he didn't play anymore, but he was just a really cool guy. And, and my band director, I told you, was, you know, we're cool now, but he was not a fan of my, me playing trombone and sort of vibed me. For, for pushing back on him and so uh, but but dr. Dunaway was like was great and he and he's really one of the one of the reasons I think that I stepped up and stuck with the trombone so if you ever see Jim, Jim Dunaway thank him <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then um, I had a a, a, a a teacher who was a local player in, in Augusta named Steve Pruitt and he, he was, he's a really slick, natural trombonist. And he would, he would uh, let me come over his school and we would play Abersalts together. Right. And, and he was probably, gosh, she was probably like, yeah, probably 30 at the time. So, you know, old enough to be older, but not, you know, too far away to, he was just very cool. Like he let me be goofy and, and I was very goofy. If you can believe that. And he just let me play and, and, and talk and so we were like you know buddies and and he gave me a lot of my first cds that i listened to like chet baker sings and miles 58 sessions he was just a really really hip dude and then i, I went to florida state and the classical trombone teacher there um, ended up being a really good mentor to me john drew he was great and he could tell i had like a lot of apprehension about studying classically being sort of self-taught and he, he, uh, he helped me with tension is one of our big things in our first lesson is he just, 
like I couldn't hold the trombone without being tense and, and uptight. And he just, he had me breathe and sort of, you know, pushed me and I was like rigid and almost fell over <laughs> That's old school technique. He was great. He, and he actually encouraged me to um, stick with jazz because I was so, you know, I, I looked up to him so much uh, that I considered dropping jazz studies and just being a classical performance major. And he was like, Michael, he's from Kentucky. So he's like, Michael, if you wanted to do that, that'd be totally fine with me. I'd love to have you. But, you know, is this, I'm, I'm going to stop the impression now. But, but he was, uh, he's like, man, you have something really special. And, you know, it doesn't come along very often. And you're just like, you love jazz music so much. I think you would really be frustrated as a performance major um, just because of the connection difference that you have with the music. Um, and that's not, he wasn't saying I couldn't do it, which I really appreciated. He was saying that he read, respected how much I love jazz music. Mm -hmm. And then he said something that like messed me up. He was like, you know, I love JJ Johnson. I was like, what? Mm -hmm. you love JJ too? And, and he's like, yeah, if I could be the next, if I could be the next JJ Johnson, that's all I do. But I was not blessed with that ability or talent. <laughs> and he and he and, and that just blew me away and it and it sort of gave me like the freedom to make a decision and a choice for myself that I didn't feel like I had before mm -hmm. and I had this really special moment you know I only studied with him for a, a, I think a semester but it was one of the most important semesters of my life and and you know I I, I still talk to him every few months and I call him and stay in touch and and I really love that guy. You know, he, he makes me call him John. I, I always want to call him Dr. Drew, but he told me a, a couple of years ago, he's like, Michael, you call me Dr. Drew one more time. Then we might as well not talk. I said, okay. All right, John, Dr. Drew. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so, so yeah, like, you know, and so, so through, through this time, like the person that, like that I saw growing up playing trombone was, um, was actually Wycliffe Gordon mm -hmm. and Wycliffe when I was trying to get really serious with the trombone again in college, um, um, I called Wycliffe and I said, man, Mr. Gordon, I, I, I really want to be around like a master jazz player and a, and a master teacher. Where are you? How can I be where you are? That's exactly what I said. How can I be where you are? <laughs> as awkward as that sounds. And he was like, cool. I teach at Michigan State and Juilliard. I said, oh, okay, well, how about Juilliard? <laughs> you know, Juilliard was the, the name that I had heard so much, mm -hmm. right? You know, in, in movies and you just, you, you, I think a lot of kids, if, if you're into music at all, you've heard of Juilliard. And so he, so he actually, um, because, you know, because he knew me, knew my family and we're from Augusta. And I was dead broke. We don't even want to talk about that. <laughs> we don't want to talk about how much money I, I did not have. Um, but he, he arranged for me to fly to Michigan State and do an audition just out of the kindness of his heart. He's like one of those kindest people I, I know. And I mean, I was like crying the whole trip because, you know, my dad had split and we weren't talking. And, and he, he was like, you know, being really kind to me and, and, and helping me out. And I was just like a wreck. So, you know, I, I ended up going to Juilliard, but the, uh, cause I, I actually got the idea that Wycliffe was at Juilliard more, uh, because he had a, he had a, he owned an apartment in New York. And my whole thing was like, I need a teacher. I need, I, I didn't realize what I was saying is I need a mentor, you know? And so the mentor aspect to me became really important. While I was at Juilliard, I also worked with Vincent Gardner. Um, and Vincent was, was really cool in lessons. You know, we, we played tunes. Um, you know, I, I wish he had been harder on me because he's so, he's so amazing. Um, but in hindsight, like I, when I look back on our lessons, I mean, he just, he just had so much respect for me as a person which uh, 
which I wasn't used to. I was, I was sort of used to, you know, people not, you know, you know, believing in my ability or respecting me as a person, like my band director, you know? Yeah. So, so I was hard for me to process Vincent's like ease and, and just like how he would like listen to me play and, and just be really thoughtful. I, you know, and in, in retrospect, I really loved the time I spent with him. Um, I bugged Joe Alessi and, 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 and Joe, uh, uh, gave me lessons and, he, and we actually traded a few lessons back and forth where I would start out with him and he would give me a, you know, a general trombone, Roshu, um, fundamentals lesson. And then I would give him a jazz, um, lesson and those were great he actually had me write uh, a couple of pieces for the juilliard trombone choir which was awesome it was an awesome experience because i you know i'm thinking like man i just started playing this instrument and i'm I, I don't think i'm that good and now i'm writing a piece and playing with like the best like young trombonists in the you know maybe in the country some of the best certainly you know and so that was just kind of like, you know, you know, I, I can't believe this is happening. This is amazing. Also, devil is like, you don't deserve this. You suck, you know? <laughs> so, so the thing, the thing that those cats, let, let me, so let me add another person too, um, Steve Ture. Mm -hmm. So um, Steve Ture came and did a master class at, um, at Juilliard and he, and he was pretty hard on me you know, and, and especially about my sound and my attack and, and it just, it, you know, you know, really made me feel like I couldn't play the trombone. So I got, I got a little down about it for a few, for probably three or four months to be honest. And, and finally I just, I did the thing that I always do when I hit a wall is I figure out a way around it. And so I said, you know what, rather than, than, than just stew on this, I'm going to go ask him for a lesson. And so I, I called him and, and he had me come out to his house in Montclair and he gave me like a nine hour lesson. <laughs> you, know, wow. his, you, think, you think my answers are long. <laughs> so I, I went out, it's, it's like a, with, with him, it was like an all day affair. And, it was just everything. It was in his basement's really cool. And it's like all these artifacts of jazz around there. And, and he didn't charge me a dime. Uh, I did some yard work for him. I almost died falling off of his roof, <laughs> but, um, but it's okay. I mean, I, I'm, I'm here and I didn't fall off the roof. It just, it felt like it, but um, I really like he, he didn't have to give me free lessons. You know, he, you know, he saw something in me that, uh, made him, you know, feel like that there was value in sharing his music with, with me for him too. Um, and that, and that, you know, and I, and I hope that he, that he feels like that the, the music is benefited that ultimately, you know, we're all serving the forces of good by sharing this music. I mean, that's certainly what his teachers did for him, you know, Rasan and Woody and, Dizzy Gillespie. So, so those are like my big, you know, trombone mentors, you know, the, um, and a, and a mentor, a, a mentor engages on whatever level is necessary to, to, to help, you know, sometimes that means not engaging too. But, but that was like, when I, when I think of all those teachers, they're, they're more than teachers for me because you know, there was a point where the information reached its, reached its end and it had, to, and it had to transform into some, into a different, into a different um, modality to get the point across, you know, John Drew, you know, was, was teaching when he taught me about posture and breath support and relaxation and, and, and that helped a ton but then he flipped the, the script, you know, and was like, I'm going to talk to Michael about loving music. You know, I'm going to share like my dreams and, and 
so that we can create a connection that's deeper than like, do this that way, listen to that, try this, here's your assignment, you know? And that's something that like all great teachers do. And, and that's where teaching transcends into the, the relationship of a mentor. All right. Now the, 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 the challenge is that students have to be ready for that mentorship too. It's a two way street, mm -hmm. you know, and that's something that I've had to learn as a teacher is that not everyone is ready for a type of mentorship, you know, and so it, it works on both sides. Like the teacher has to be insightful and, and sort of use their experience to understand, like, how am I going to get through this student? You know, how can I help? What will not help? <laughs> you know? And then the student has to, has to sit and, um, and, and do their work too. You know, it's like you can cook the grits, but if the grit doesn't get soaked, with the water, it won't get soft enough to eat, you know? So, so I never used grits as an analogy. But. Yeah. That's the first time I've heard that one from you. <laughs> that's a good one. I like that. <laughs> but it's, but it's, it, it, it's really deep. Like, um, you know, how many times have, have your, your parents, you know, you know, what, what maybe Bob Glassman, you know, your mom, Gina, right. How many times have they said something and you've not been ready to hear it? and it's been correct, and then you get, and then you, you get it later. And if you yeah. weren't trying to, diso to, to not hear them on purpose, you just weren't ready, yeah. Yeah. you know? Now here's the thing, you can, you, can, you can work to be ready for those things. It just, it, it takes getting out of your comfort zone. You know, it takes, you know, when, when you're hearing something that you don't understand, you have to step back and pause and get stillness and think like, okay, I don't like this answer, but do I think my teacher or mentor is telling me something to, to hurt me? Yeah. You know, I can't tell you how many students I've had over 15 years that I've asked to write down their schedules. Now it's Google, you know, Google calendar and all that stuff. But, mm -hmm. but I've always said, you know, schedule your practice and then follow your schedule. Once you follow, once you make your schedule, follow it. And that way you'll get accomplished, you know, what you need to get done throughout the day. Years go by, you know, hopefully at six months, but sometimes a year. Prof, man, you were totally right about writing those things down. Like, man, I, I did my, I followed my schedule for like a, a week and I hated it at first, but man, it felt so good at the end of the week, you know, it's like, so, so I actually did that with Steve, with, with, um, with pretty much all my mentors is I, you know, I made sure that I readied myself for what they had to offer. I'll give you an example with Steve Ture. So Steve, um, I like to play things, you know, too fast. You know, that's like my default. So when I practice, I, I actually play things too slow. <laughs> but there is no too slow. So, <laughs> so I would play for Steve because he's one of my trombone heroes and, and, and was my teacher at the time. And I wanted, you know, you know, it's, it's, you know, childlike, but I wanted to impress him. You know, that's sometimes that we, sometimes we're in that space as young people. And so he said, let me, you know, you know, he's got a cool voice. He goes, let me hear you play. Uh, Donna Lee, you know, like that, right? We're playing, so I go, bah, 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 bah. he's like, no, 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 no. That wasn't clear. And so, so we, long story short, he has me play it here. Right. And, and I remember thinking, man, this, this is not fun. <laughs> <laughs> this is not how I thought I would be working on playing better. Yeah. And, uh, and so, and so the next time I came back for a lesson, I just, I didn't do it. I didn't practice slow. You know, I blew it off. I, I did the other things, you know, work, transcribe a solo and yada, yada. And then he said, Mike, 
you didn't practice slow, did you? And I was like, no. And he's like, I know, I can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, man, you know, I can either be sort of a, a jackass student and just waste his time and then I won't get anything out of it either. So I'll be wasting my own time. Or I can just grow up and realize that in order to get what he's saying, I'm going to have to develop patience and practice in a way that I'm not used to. And so my, but my third lesson, I played it and he gave me like a high five. I'll never forget it. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, so mentorship is like, is, is I think having a mentor is, is so important, you know, and it's, and it's not about like the very, you know, the, giving people gigs and hooking them up with stuff or all that's easy. Anybody can do that. But, but it's, you know, mentors to me, you know, truly care about their um, mentees growth. Right. And they're willing to adjust themselves for the, for the, for the purpose and the progress of the whole relationship mentor and mentee, you know, it's just like when, uh, you know, Dizzy Gillespie, Jim, Jimmy Heath has a, has a uh, composition that uh, he wrote for Dizzy Gillespie called Without You Know Me. And that's, that's, I think, what I'm trying to say is that is like mentors truly see the future of the music and the legacy of the art and their art in their students. And that, and that's just different than like scales at 60 beats a minute. I mean, that's, there's a place for that too. But the, the, when you think about things in sort of a, you know, a larger, you know, dare I say, grander scale, um, it puts a little more gravity on the relationship. And, and so that was like, and, and if you're not ready for a mentor, that could be like, that could be, a, that could be like a challenge. You know, if you're just like, um, you know, hey, it's my lesson time. You know, I get to go out of the house for two hours. And then your teacher's like, you see, music, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's totally a space for like, hey, get your stuff together. And, you know, we got chair tests next week in band, you know. Um, and there's plenty of teachers that, that I think, I mean, basically anybody can do that. <clears throat> I mean, there's curriculums you can get. There's books you can buy that tell you how much of, of, of this and what to do with that. But what do you do when like that doesn't work? You know, when a student like is depressed about something that they can't put into words and like won't practice or, or they don't know how to prioritize time away from their friends. You know, or they grew up listening to one style of music and don't understand a, a different style. That takes like outside of the box teaching. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of times like those, you know, sort of trickier obstacles, they're hard to reach without a, like that understanding of each other that a, a mentor relationship provides. Mm -hmm. and I think that's, that's one of the reasons I like being in Michigan State so much is that is that um we really try to do that we really try to listen and, and understand where our students are coming from and give them like a tailored and and and, and um <clears throat> you know respectful and tr try to really hear them so that we can we can teach them and guide them as, as effectively as we can so just a quick follow-up with that one do you have any recommendations for students on the best practice for finding a mentor and the approach? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of information online. You know, I hate that's such a cliche answer. Right. But, but uh, like the very first thing I do whenever I'm trying to figure something out is just as much Google research as I can knowing that it's not empirical data, right? 
Like you, like the same thing with Wikipedia. Like, like Wikipedia is great, but you can't go there expecting everything to be perfect. You know, it's just not. You know, it's it's a, uh, it's maintained and checked by everyone. So, so it's it's just a collection and aggregate of data. So, you know, I, I think knowing what a mentor is and, and reading about mentors in different fields and just having as much information about, you know, what mentors are and, and who they are and what they do and how they exist. And, and, you know, that, that's, you know, that's several hours of Googling and, and reading things and it's totally worth it. You know, it's totally worth it. Um, you know, for, for me, it's, finding a mentor was, was pretty simple in the, in the, um, in the respect that I kept it situated. I kept my like search situated around my interests, you know? So, you know, like for instance, Dr. Dunaway, he was, he was the, to me, the most serious musician at my high school. You know, he was, he was, he was really a thorough choir director I'll, he used to get on me about my pr pronunciation because I, I have a little lisp, and he was like, he'd be like, Michael, Dona Nobis. <laughs> I'd be like, Dona. He's like, No, 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 Dona. <laughs> and I'd be like, okay, Dona. He's like, Very good, Michael. Very good. Parcha, parcha. You know, and it's like it's like those things stuck with me, you know. That's over 20 years ago. I still remember them like I was there. And so I, I started building up this like thought about Dr. Dunaway. I was like, man, Dr. Dunaway, that's a serious dude. He is like, he will not rest until something's perfect. You know, I wonder what he would think about my trombone playing. <laughs> you know, little, little like connecting the dots type things, you know, you know, the, the, those things I, I still do. I remember on break, years ago i've been in the christian mcbride big band for well uh 12 11 12 years and um i remember one time at dizzy's we were in the in the room in the back the lewis armstrong classroom and i asked uh douglas provience for some bass trombone tips and you know he's like get out of here man come on <laughs> and i was like no i'm serious um you know if you if, if you don't want to that's fine but like i want to i mean i would really love to hear what you would say to someone like me who's I'm not a bass trombonist, um, like how to work on this. And he did, he did. He, he spoke to me about 10 minutes about what he thinks about with air and, and voicing and everything. And I have it recorded. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Steve Wilson. Like I asked Steve Wilson about how he, you know, what he thinks about when he goes outside of traditional harmony little things like that um you know and and i remember thinking like these are my bandmates and they're approachable and we're you know we're friends at this point and colleagues and i said you know i'm gonna put on a line and i'll ask a question and i'll come from a humble place you know like i think uh i think that's a good a good sort of way to check yourself when you're dealing with you know older and experienced musicians is really ask yourself, like, are you coming out of a place of um, manipulation? Or are you coming out of a place of like curiosity or are you coming out of a place of humility? You know, and, and the humility one always works, you know, like if you, if you are coming out of a place of respect and wonderment and knowledge and, and, and trying to do something better is cool. You can be, you know, proud of your engagement from your side. And not everybody's going to like that um, because not everybody's meant to be your mentor. I remember reaching out to Conrad Herwig and Robin Eubanks just because they had a lot of music online at the time. You know, this is like 1999. And Robin was with uh, Dave Holland's quintet. So... I had seen him with Dave Holland and Chris Potter and 
he's touring all over the world. That band was like super big time um, during that time. Uh, Conrad was um, was my all state coach for all state jazz. So that was that was pretty in- insane to to see to see him do that on the trombone. Sorry, my kids are. <laughs> But they, uh, that was that was nuts to see Conrad as a senior in high school, and he did the he did the the, the high note different position thing, and I was like, whoa, <laughs> it's like crazy. Man, this guy is like an animal. Just like the trombone is like a toy. It's like a wand, you know. And he's a wizard. And uh, and I wrote him. I actually wrote him because I was I wasn't sure if I wanted to stick with trombone. I was getting kind of intimidated and he wrote me back and was like, Hey man, you know, sounds like you're, sounds like you're got some good stuff going. Stick with it, kid. We need, we need you out here. Something like something like real, real cool. And I always wish that I had looked him up more when I got to New York. I, I called him right when I got to town and he put me on the list at, for the Mingus band, which is to show you how cool he is. I mean, he just did that. And, and that, that's like mentorship. You know, there's like nothing in it for him. You know, he's he's just he recognizes that somebody that he's inspired somebody and that he wants somebody wants to do this, and he's like lending a helping hand. You know that that's that's fantastic. And I went to see him, and quite honestly, he played so much trombone that I told myself I would reach out to him again when I got better. And I just never thought I got better. <laughs> <laughs> so so that that's like another thing is um you know like something I, I learned is that if when a mentor like opens a door for you you know really really look at it and if you're not ready then then be honest and you know maybe not be ready and and but if you if you're if you are take advantage of that opportunity and be present mm-hmm. You know, like, like, uh, that was, if I could go back and do that over again, you know, I would have called him back and, and thank you so much. I mean, I would love to come out next month and he might say, well, Hey, send me an email closer to the date and and then we could keep doing that. I wasn't ready, you know? So, so, so yeah, just, just reaching out, you, you, you know, this doesn't hurt either. Um, but I, I just think like when you, when you take an opportunity to engage with someone at the top of your field, I mean, I, I really think that it needs to be more than sort of, you know, the Chris Farley where he has a talk show and he's like, Hey man, um, do you remember when you did that thing? Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> you remember, have you seen that, that clip? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, it's the, the the joke, Gina, is that Chris Farley is hosting a, a talk show for famous people, but he's so like sort of intimidated, he like can't believe that they're there with him, and he and he just gets really like like fan kind of fanboyish. You know, he's like, "Yeah, that was awesome, dude! <laughs> wow, oh, man, you're like right here. I can touch you. Wow, <laughs> it's like, is that pretty? Is that is that right, Chris?" Yeah, it's like the opposite of Beyond Two Ferns, where he just grills them. It's like the opposite right. of that. <laughs> right. So, so you know, I, that's just I, like, like man, like if, if I had a, you know, a chance to meet J.J. Johnson, I, I tell you, I, I got to meet President Obama once, and I completely froze. You know, he's met so many people, but there's definitely one person he met me that was like, har, 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 har. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, just like nothing worked. Like I can, I can go. I can do all this stuff, doodle stuff with my tongue, and I my tongue and air and phonetics could not work <laughs> in front of a Barack Obama. I'll never forget that. But yeah, you know, you know, just and just just reaching out because like they, if you don't talk to them, then then your your mentors might not know you're there. Yeah. And and so and sometimes it takes time. Like uh, I think a lot of people get discouraged too quickly. Um, 
I remember Rufus Reed, um, who, who's one of my mentors and, and a close friend. Um, when I first met him, see, he was the bass player on one of my first favorite records, um, Stan Getz's uh, Serenity, right? And I wore that record out, man, let me tell you. I mean, I could sing every solo on the record. And I, and I remember thinking, man, if I ever got to meet Rufus Reed, I would be so cool to him, you know? You know, I was just, just, just like a big dork. And I met Mr. Reed at Betty Carter's Jazz Ahead when he was a uh, bass faculty there. And I, and I just, I was like, gotta play it cool, Mike. Play it cool. Don't let him know that you're a huge fan. You know, just be cool. And so I, I tried to be cool, but I'm pretty sure I seemed like creepy. <laughs> Like, you know, this is, this is terrible. And, and then I, and then I didn't know what to do. So afterwards I said, Mr. Reed, um, um, I'd really like to take you out for lunch. And he was like, he just looked at me like, hmm? <laughs> and I was like, Oh no, I, I think I just asked him out on a date. <laughs> I mean, I just, I didn't know, like, I, I was so nervous because I wanted to pick his brain. You know, I wanted to ask him about all of his experiences and like, how did he develop such like an amazing tone and all, all this stuff, all these things like that I wanted that a mentor would share. And he, he was like, um, well, uh, maybe one day, uh, you know, I don't really quite know you son, but, uh, Thank you. <laughs> but then I got to know him better. I got to, it took some, I didn't give up. And every time I saw him play, I said, Hey, Mr. Reed, it's Mike D's. And, you know, I just, I'm from Betty Carter and I just love your plan. And, and then he ended up calling me for his big band. And, 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 and then he, you know, Gwen and I commissioned him to write a piece, mm -hmm. a trio piece. And, we've become quite close over the years and he's, he's been a huge help to me in all these projects. And, 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 uh, and I just, I, I'll never forget, you know, we had some pretty awkward beginnings, m m all my fault, <laughs> but, but I didn't let that discourage me, you know, and it came from a really honest place. I mean, that's the, you know, so, so, so yeah, just with, with mentors, like you gotta look for them. And, rem and remember, like, teachers and mentors are people, too. Like, they, they have issues and problems and insecurities just like everybody else. You know, not everybody is the right mentor for, for everyone. I've had to, you know, at times put distance between myself and my mentors. And I'm sure some of them have felt that way with me. <laughs> so so it's, a, it's a relationship. It's like, you know, just like a plant, you know, water and sunlight. Water, sunlight. You know, uh, and if you can't, you know, you don't, you can't control the water and the sunlight when you're not there. You, you never know where someone's water or sun is coming from. To add to that, uh, if you've listened this far, then you get to know that next episode is actually featuring Mr. Reed. So, oh, Rufus Reed? Yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh. So the next episode after this we get to hear from Mr. Reed. That's really exciting. Oh, wow. And this won't be in it, but he said very <laughs> nice things about you, Prof. So oh, it's kind yeah. of funny when you started talking about him. Me and Chris were like. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's, he's the best. I mean, he was, um, I mean, one of the coolest moments of my, you know, music, my own music, um, not my sideman stuff, but is I asked Rufus if he would play on uh, the latest recording, Nevermore Here. And we did, we did um, a couple of songs in the spirit of JJ, uh, Lament and Blue Jay, which is which is really my my version of uh, Blue Trombone, and then Shortcake. And so you know, Rufus like created that with JJ, mm -hmm. and so to get him to create that with me. Like was a really special moment for me in my 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 own personal music uh, life, and and and, the, and you know the, the fact that we recorded it and it's down for for all time, you know, that that was really meaningful. Uh, yes. That's killer.
So you talk about best practices. Can mm -hmm. you tell the audience what that is? Best practices. Yeah. Um, best practices. It's a, it's a, it's a concept uh, that people use in business. Um, I use it in music as a way of identifying something that has a track record of working for a lot of people. Mm. All right. So for instance, a um, very simple best practice for a musician is working with long tones and flexibility with it, with a tuner. Right. So, so it's, uh, it's proven <laughs> that if you work regularly with a tuner, uh, and, and applying the uh, intonation information to your positions and your air and everything that uh, your intonation will get better, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, things like transcribing, playing things in 12 keys, working on songs uh, in, in different keys, playing different tempos, you know, all these things have been shown to improve all those skills you know, as they exist on their own. So, so for instance, if you, if you transcribe a lot of a particular style and get that, get that information and vocabulary second nature into your playing, then as you play other material, those ideas will start to surface that influence will start to show in your style. Like your style will change and adapt based on what you're feeding it. You know, your style is kind of like an animal. <laughs> you know, if you feed it, you know, kibble and mud, then, you know, that's what it's going to be like. Um, but if you feed it bebop and asparagus, well, <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, th that's what best practices are. I mean, best practices are, uh, are things that have worked for either the community at large or have worked in um, specific situations and you see that information like that's like data now this works therefore you're gonna try it yeah. and, and uh, yeah it, it, it's it's really a uh, I mean teaching myself that had to that became like a, a really important tool for me like not having any anyone I, I didn't get a Abersol book or a scale sheet or, you know, play thirds or, you know, no advice like that. I, all I had was JJ Johnson live at the Vanguard. And as I was learning those tunes, you know, I had to come up with something, you know, to, to try to play like it. I said, well, what am I going to do? Well, I'll play when I play that tune, what do I do? So I, I started playing the solos and, you know, once I had memorized the solo, I could play them. I, I started breaking them apart. And now I'm using different phrases in different places. Now that, now that I know the phrases, I've, you know, mastered the phrases, I start playing with them in my own way. You know, so a phrase like, bubba da bubba da bubba da bubba da bubba da bubba da now becomes, bubba da 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 bubba right? It's similar, but it's not the same, yeah. right? It's like got all the same parts. It's just like a calzone and a pizza, you know? It's like, you know, if you've got your pizza right there, it's like, oh, pizza. But if you take it and wrap it <laughs> and fold it in on itself and bake it, calzone! <laughs> you, know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, that happened and all of a sudden, you know, the, the people I was trying to play with and, and learn from were like, man, how did you learn to play jazz? So the records taught me so much. I mean, I mean, that was, uh, was pretty much everything. I, I, I think like for jazz, learning jazz, like learning how to play the music that was created before you started playing jazz, right? This is different than like, innovation or coming up with something new i'm talking about learning jazz <laughs> just like you're learning to play the trombone i think the music contains all the best practices you just have to break it down and identify like the the ex exact practices that got this to happen 
how can Philly Joe like play a tune for like seven minutes and not rush or drag extremely? You know, there's a, there's something he did in his development that worked for him that will very likely work for other people. And that's ultimately a best practice. Yeah. I have a question about diversity. So you've always gone pretty out of your way, not only to include people of color and women in your ensembles. And even when I reach out for putting together projects for myself, you also stress the importance of diversity. Can you talk about your commitment to diversity? Yeah. I'm still learning how to realize my commitment the, the best and the most effective and most respectful way. You know, I mean, I think that's everything that's happening right now with uh, the racism very top of our government, like that's um, bringing a lot of these questions to bear. The, the way I was raised, I was raised very unusually. Um, my father is, is white. He's from Alabama. And my mother is adopted. She was adopted by a, a black family from Georgia or from South Georgia. And then they, they had actually moved to New York. Uh, so she was adopted in New York. Her birth mother is black. And then her birth father, bi biological father is Italian. So my mom is technically, you know, 50, 50 black and white, but she, all her family that she knew growing up were black. So she grew up as a black person. And so when I grew up, I have a, a, a black mother who's technically a black and Italian mother. And then a white father who grew up in the South in a, a hotbed of like sort of racist old, old boys club environment. So I was getting, I was getting sort of a lot of information at home, you know, like my dad is still alive and, and we're, we're pretty close, but he, he holds on to a lot of his bigoted views. I, I'm not entirely sure how he married my mother. <laughs> that's, that's typically not what people with, with, with racist tendencies do. I don't, they usually don't go out and marry a black woman, but, but they did. And so I grew up on one side, you know, reading Malcolm X's autobiography and, and I grew up in a room where the Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech was on my closet door. And, and then in, my, in the other room, my dad was screaming the N word at the TV during the Rodney King riots. Oh. You know, I, I just had a lot of information and the, the, the town in Augusta during those times, during the eighties there, I didn't see a lot of people that looked like me. There were, there were, definitely a lot of white people. There was a black part of Augusta, South Augusta, that had a high concentration of black people. And then there were mixed kids, uh, which is what I considered myself growing up, um, not biracial or not, not uh, black until later, but mixed was, was the word that we got a lot. Um, and they're just, it kind of seemed like if you weren't white or black, there, was, there, there wasn't a culture for you. In a, in a culture meaning like a community. So a lot of biracial kids where I'm from, when I grew up, picked, like you picked whether you were white or black. And, and you, uh, sometimes that choice was made by how white or black you looked, <laughs> or sometimes it made, it was picked by like which culture you felt like closer to being or, or, or connecting with. Um, I know as a kid, like when, when I grew up, I, I didn't grow up around a lot of black children or black adults. Like it was like my mom and a couple of my parents or, uh, of my mom's family would come visit. And I never tried to, to speak or talk any particular way, but um, my friends, my classmates, like, uh, you know, second, third, fourth grade, you know, would always joke whenever it came time for like, you know, race jokes or whatever would say that I talked like a white guy. And it's like, oh, you know, Mike, you talk white. And I said, what, what are you talking about? And then they would go, black, my black friends would be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> type thing. And I was like, you know, it was very confusing. And so, you know, the, as I got older and, and started wanting to 
you know, it's not really an answer to that type of thing, but I, I just wanted to figure out like where I fit in this conundrum, right? The more that I got to learn about black history and, you know, consequentially, you know, evolving into a jazz musician, like American history sort of making even, you know, more sense and became more personal to me. Like I started embracing my black roots, you know, actively rather than passively. So I started reading uh, and, and, and watching as many documentaries and, and getting as informed as I could about what black Americans had to deal with um, as slaves, you know, for hundreds of years and, and all the different different things that black intellectuals and scholars have brought. I read W.E.B. Du Bois's uh, Souls of Black Folk, Frederick Douglass's books, and, and, and then even being as, as light-skinned as I am. I, mean, I was a little darker when I was younger, and I, and I was called the N-word pretty frequently, and other things that I prefer not to talk about <laughs> right now. But, uh, you know, it, it, racism sucks, and, and I felt like that I connected more to my mother and my mother's family more than what my father uh, represented. And that being part black and having the, you know, the ancestral option to, to connect and identify as a black person, you know, that was, that's enough for me, you know? And I, and I recognize like something I've learned in this time is that despite the racism I've, uh, seen and i see a lot of racism that darker skinned black people don't see because you know people see me and they don't immediately think oh it's a black guy i gotta watch what i can't say this i can't say that so i get to hear those things uh and they're they're not good <laughs> so, you know I, I made a long facebook post about about it uh so so yeah so i long story short with that is that i i identify as a black american and i'm proud of it and I understand that I don't know exactly the black experience because I can walk in a world and not be identified by the color of my skin. You know, even if some do, many don't. Mm -hmm. And black Americans don't have that luxury. They can never not be black. And that's why it's so important to um, fight and, and, and fight against racism because no one should have to, to suffer anything based on the color of their skin. All right. You ever seen that thing where there's the three color eggs and they crack the eggs and cook the eggs. They're all the same. Mm -hmm. yeah, that time's a million. <laughs> so, so that ex I had to kind of tell you that experience because that's where my, my commitment to diversity comes from. Um, it's, it's because, I, f I feel like I know what it's like to look look at a place and say, there's no seat at the table for me. And I, I feel that, I felt that as like a white person, I felt that as a black person. I mean, I've been in bands where I sit around and I realize I'm the only black person in the band. And then I say, they probably didn't know. <laughs> you know, and, it, and I, and he, he, here's what I think. I think, you know, that when you have a small group like a trio or a quartet or a quintet, and you want to use the people that you're playing with, and it's a small number of people, like that kind of makes sense. Like sometimes your core group of people looks like you, whether it's white or black people or Asian people or, or women or gay people, like people hang around people that are familiar sometimes. Like that, that happens. But when you get 20 people in a big band that all are men, then we have a problem. You know, it's exclusive at that point. It, it, when, when, you find, when you find five saxophones, four trombones, four trumpets, three rhythm section people, special guests, and they're all men. Like that looks like you're trying to hire men. Or it looks like you don't either you either don't know any women or you're not interested in finding them. So I, I don't like the exclusive thing. You know, I, I like the the welcoming thing and I and I'm I'm proof that that like being able to see yourself in a situation matters. 
you know, like one of the reasons that I, that diversity is so important to me is because I felt the pain of like feeling like I'll never be able to do that. You know, just, just, just because of the way it's something that just because of the way it looks. So I can only imagine like what women feel like looking at jazz where it seems like if you're not like one of four women, then you're not going to be on it. And, and I think other women, young, young ladies and young girls see, see this like masculine world. And, and it's just like, whether con subconsciously or consciously, the message is being sent is like, this isn't really a thing for you. And I don't like that. I don't like that one bit. I don't like it as it pertains to race. I don't like, <clears throat> like it as it pertains to <clears throat> sexuality. Um, or nationality or anything like that. I think <clears throat> music is a universal language and everybody can speak and everybody should feel welcome. So, so that's why <clears throat> it's important. It's important to me in, in anything that I'm involved with that I care about that everybody feels welcome at the table. And in, in music and in, in my little niche you know, that means that women and people of color need to be in the band. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes that means finding them. You know, I wish it weren't, weren't that way, but we're not at that place yet. We're, we're not at a place where, <clears throat> where if we're, where we can go within arm's reach and find what we need. Yeah, and, and and another, you know, I, this is this is just again, just how I how I feel about myself. I don't put this on anybody else, but I, I sort of feel like if I'm not a part of the solution, then I'm part of the problem. And so I, it starts with me, and that's the kind of you know when you have kids too. It's that's that's what I that's what I want for my daughters. You know, I want them to uh, to not to to feel welcome. In whatever they choose to do. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. So it feels like we have our final words. Mm -hmm. Do you have any last advice that you want to give to our listeners? You know, hey. advice. Um, what's what's my man that does the one minute jazz videos? Um, um, what, what what is the thing he does? The lick, he goes, da, yeah. da, 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 da. Is that what he does on his video? It's the lick, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the uh, the old Michael Scott favorite, Keep It Simple Stupid. Mm. That the, uh, that's not where that comes from, obviously. But, um, <laughs> you know, that's that's something that I, I rely on all the time is, is there's so much in life and so much of the mechanics of music and, and, you know, the being in the right place at the right time and all these things that, that feel very complicated and they feel out of, out of your control that when, when, when I do have control over something, I want it to be simple, mm -hmm. you know, not as simple as possible, but, but I don't want it to be like complex or a drag or, or something that's going to like, you know, you know, twist my brain into segments, you know, like, um, like keeping things simple, like, uh, like I, I'll give you a simple, like, like simple for me is when, when I fell in love with the trombone, I just wanted to play. It's like, gosh, you know, my, my dad, um, was a recruiter for a junior college and then sold a manufacturer, or, uh, he sold, uh, it's hard to say what his homes are. He, he, so he sold like uh, pre-built homes. And then my mom sold insurance and they were, they, and it, it's a competitive job and they sort of got into the sales, you know, game with that, but they weren't passionate about it in the way that you are of something that you love. Some people get passionate about a paycheck. <laughs> it's like, I'll do whatever as long as I make the money I want. Well, for me, it's very simple. Keep it simple, right? I wanted to be someone in my family that did what they loved, you know, and I wasn't super concerned about the bread. 
you know, I, meaning the money, like I, I knew I would, if I loved it, I would do a good enough job to make a living. And so that's the nucleus. That's the start. Like, you know, I wanted, that's to me, that's like a very charmed life. You know, not, not many people, I mean, how many people can you, I mean, we're musicians, so we know a lot of people, but, but like very few people can say like, man, you know, I really love this. And it's like, I'm not even working. This is great. I mean, there's a work side of it, like being organized, being on time and, and responding to emails and yada, yada, yada. But beyond that, playing trombone, you used to do that in school for fun, right? And then, you know, as, as that sort of went from the macro to the micro, like the micro became, you know, man, I just, I'm so inspired by Kid Ori and Jack T Garden and JJ and, you know, Bill Watrous and Steve Teray and all these cats. Man, I kind of want to do what they do. Simple. You know what I mean? When it came time to, uh, you know, get my playing together, I went and got a good teacher. When it came time to uh, really get the fine details together, I went to Joe Alessi. You know, Joe Alessi. He knows. <laughs> so, I mean, just keeping it simple, like, you know, I, I mean, JJ is a big uh, hero of mine on the instrument. So is Irby. And Joe Alessi, you know, uh, technically speaking, is my closest link to that. So it was like very important that I just saw his mouth and heard his words opening about, about what this happened, you know. Uh, so yeah, I mean, just following that trajectory of, of just every, everything that I've, I've tried to do for myself was related to, man, I just want to play jazz and, and, I, and, and I want to play jazz jazz, you know. Like I want to, I want to swing. I want to play funky. I mean, I, I grew up in Augusta. James Brown, and Fred Wesley are really important to me. So that that's something. That's something is you know, as you learn, as you get exposed to music, you know, learn about it, get into it, fall in love with it, and then think you know, boil it down and come up with something simple and easy. Like you know, becoming a jazz trombone soloist you know, isn't like the easiest thing in the world, but it is the most fun, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's so much fun to, you know, to write tunes, to work on work on these things, to, to play people's music. I've got some record dates coming up um, that I am like just ecstatic about. Every, every, every year I get called to do a record date with some huge star or, somebody I just really look up to. And I got a call last week, you know, can you, can you make the date? And I'm like, yes, yes, I will be there. Like, I didn't tell you how much it plays. I'll be there, whatever, whatever. I'm sure it pays. <laughs> you know. So, I mean, that's, that's keep it simple. Um, draw strength from the simplicity, you know, and, um, I just love what you're doing. That's why I teach too. You know, you know, I, I teach so that uh, people like me that want to do something don't have to piece it together as, as strangely as I did. So last thing is just while we're wrapping up, if there's anybody out there that's interested in learning more about you or maybe getting in contact with you at MSU, what's the easiest way for them to do so? Yeah, e easiest way is to email me at my school website uh, or email address, which is uh, mdes, M-D-E-A-S-E, at msu.edu. And uh, I am giving lessons uh, over COVID that are, that are a discounted rate than my usual uh, rate, which is on my website. So if anybody's interested in getting in touch, definitely um, if you're interested in attending for – a bachelor's or master's study. We also have a degree that is that is not used very often because it's very specialized called the performance certificate, uh, performance diploma, which is very inexpensive. 
and it just deals with um, uh, performance and lessons. And you do four recitals instead of one. How'd you guys like that? Four recitals. Oh. Oof. But, it's, but it's great. You don't have any classwork. You yeah. don't you just, you just work on, you know. The performances. Wow. Yeah. So it would be, it would be like the equivalent of recording four CDs in two years. And that's called the performance diploma. And it's, uh, you get lessons and ensemble and you still, you still get to do all the cool stuff. So we, we might have some people doing that next year, actually. Killing. Great. And could you tell us what your website is? Ooh, okay. Here it is. Ready? Ready. MichaelDees.com. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah m-i-c-h-a-e-l-d-e-a-s-e um dot com uh yeah and, and it's um you guys always say it right but i know some people are confused about how to pronounce my last name it's um it's d's like a z sound mm -hmm. uh like please yeah yeah exactly it's, it's spelled the same way as please like e-a-s-e uh I, I i hear a lot of mike dees sometimes which is which is fine i mean i don't care but um you know for anybody that wants to to know what it is it's um let me just say that um you know i i am and remain super proud of you too and um you know y'all are just you know I, I love that you know you came up with this idea on your own and and that y'all have such a, a collaborative and and strong camaraderie with one another i mean that's that's really important and then, and then too, like giving a voice for um, the cats, um, especially like the bass trombonists. I mean, that's, I mean, that that's really crucial because, I mean, I've watched most of the videos that y'all have done, and and they're they're just like dropping great nuggets of wisdom, and and I mean, they you know the trombones, especially the bass trombones, they've they've seen and heard everything. They're there and they're listening. And, and, and they, they know what's happening. And there's not a whole ton of them. Uh, uh, and, and there's just a, has been an information gap yeah. with the bass trombone cats um, and the next generation that I think y'all are helping to fill. And so I'm really proud of you and, and y'all just, you're playing your butts off and, and I'm just happy to have been there for a small part of it. Thank you so much. Appreciate and thank you again for your time. Appreciate you being on. Yeah. yeah thank you so much. You got it. All right. Take care. May the force be with you. <laughs> and, uh, catch you. All right. Bye. We get a bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.